Lord, as we turn to your word now, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes, give us understanding, cause us to see things that uh, maybe we hadn't thought about before or, or uh, experienced even before. But Father, you've called us to a life of uh, godliness and, and holiness before you. So equip us and enable us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was a couple of weeks ago in uh, Sutherland, Texas, that First Baptist Church was changed forever. And in what was an absolutely unspeakable act of violence, uh, 26 lives were senselessly taken, and almost that many people were wounded. You know, one of the worst things about social media is the ability for people to step into real life circumstances and act as if it's somehow some abstract, not real, and, and they say and they communicate things that are oftentimes uh, very mean and, and very angry and very evil. It's not a secret, is it, for those of us who are Christ followers to know that we live in a hostile environment that the things that we hold dear, the things that we think are important, the world oftentimes looks at and mocks and laughs and thinks that those things are kind of silly. One of those things would be prayer. It was after that experience that uh, an actor by the name of Michael McKinn mocked those involved and said they had the prayer shot right out of them. Maybe they should try something else. Actor Will Wheaton said, if prayers did anything, they'd still be alive. I don't know either of those guys. I have no idea what their hearts are. I don't have any idea what their motivations were in saying those things. Maybe they regretted it as soon as they posted it. But it was kind of reflective of how it is that people respond in our day and time and how the world does mock people, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. The world doesn't understand Christianity. The world doesn't understand the cross. The world doesn't understand what Christ has called us to as his children. Jesus said in this life, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So we're going to look this morning at the last of the Beatitudes in this opening section of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we have in these opening 12 verses what we call the Beatitudes, and we're going to look this morning at the last of those in verses 10, 11, and 12. And this is what we want to see. When the world encounters a Christian, there will be conflict, there will be guilt, there will be persecute, there'll be resentment, there'll be persecution. And we know all of that because Jesus said so, right? Jesus said that's the way it would be quick review of the Beatitudes. Remember, we have said that what we have here is really a list that paints for us a picture of the portrait of the life of Christ. You know, when we, when we say, what would Jesus do? We don't have to, in this case, ask what would Jesus do? We can just look at this list and say, this is what Jesus did. This is how Jesus lived his life. This is the way he put before us uh, the, the life that he wants us to live as well. It's how he lived, it's how we're to live. The second thing we noted was that Jesus' list is, I think, probably far different than one that we might have written down. I mean, if I would give us all an assignment this morning and say, write down eight things that you think would be reflective of the life that Jesus wants us to live. What are some of the things that you suppose would be on that list? I have a feeling that a lot of us would put really good things like read your Bible every day, pray, try to be a witness for Christ, go to church. And, I, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that many of our lists would have those kinds of things on there. And every one of those things is absolutely important. And every one of those things is vital to our walk with God, isn't it? But isn't it interesting that when Jesus puts forth this portrait, which is really a picture of how it is that he lived life in the power of God's Spirit, in full submission to the will of the Father, he drills down into the inner attitudes of the heart. And that's where Jesus always went, didn't he? He always started by taking us to the heart. Well, then I think lastly, what we have in this list really is the demands of discipleship. It's the demands of discipleship. Here, here is what a fully devoted follower of Christ looks like. 
So if we have in this picture, this portrait of Christ, then obviously that's what we should see in our life and that's what the discipleship demands look like in our life. So let's look at the blessing this morning of persecution. Yeah, that's right, the blessing of persecution because that's what Jesus said, right? Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted. Can I start off with something of a personal disclaimer? When I was thinking this week about this particular study and as I was thinking about the previous seven Beatitudes, I I had to just acknowledge in my heart that this one is in many respects the most difficult for me to relate to. I mean, here we are. We live in the land uh, that God has blessed with the greatest freedoms possible. All of my coworkers are wonderful people. I don't have daily battles as some of you do with maybe somebody who's totally hostile to your faith. I don't have to worry about somebody, you know, attacking me in that way in in the workplace. Uh, And so as as I was working through this, I thought, you know, this is really, in many respects, one of the Beatitudes that probably I connect with the least. Doesn't mean I haven't had experiences in which it felt like this was happening to me, but in terms of just day to day, week to week, month to month, my life has been incredibly blessed. I think that may be true for many of you, not all of you, but the other part of that is we don't want to relax. We don't want to put down our guard and say, yeah, man, my life is so good. These must apply to somebody somewhere because I do believe that as we see what's happening in our culture and society, the day is coming upon us in which more and more of us are going to experience the very things that Jesus talks about in these verses. And it's happening with greater frequency, and we could point to any number of illustrations, but I believe that is the day that we are facing as we move forward. So let's start off. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Let's let's start off by talking first about, about what false ideas does this beatitude dispel? What is Jesus wanting us to realize is not true because he spoke the words that he did? Well, first of all, Jesus has promised deliverance from all suffering. That's simply false, isn't it? He dispels that myth right here. These verses don't make it in the top 10 of uh, prosperity gospel preachers' list of favorite passages. I don't know that any of those guys ever go to Matthew 5, 10, 11, and 12. It doesn't fit exactly with what they're teaching, does it? Uh, this isn't talking about the best life that you've got coming. This is, in fact, talking about a really bad life that may come your way. A lot of persecution, a lot of slander, a lot of uh, people reviling you. So Jesus is not promising us deliverance from suffering as his follower. Secondly, suffering is a sign of God's displeasure or sin. Jesus does away with that idea too, doesn't he? If you are experiencing some of these things, if you are suffering, if there is a a, a hard place in your life, it's not necessarily to be understood that it is because of God's displeasure in your life or because of sin. It's easy to go there, isn't it? It's easy to think when bad things happen to us that maybe I've done something wrong and there's nothing wrong with self-examination. But Jesus certainly says to us here, those followers of his who are what? Those who are living out these beatitudes. Those who are pure in heart. Those who are merciful. Those who are totally dependent on God. They're the ones who may very well be experiencing these things. Thirdly, suffering can separate us from the love of Christ. Jesus dispels that thought because quite the opposite is promised. He says, in fact, if we are persecuted, we should, in fact, be expecting that we're going to inherit inherit the kingdom of God. So he has wonderful things to say for those who, in fact, do suffer. Paul said in Romans 8, 35, what is it that can separate us from the love of God? And he lists out, can tribulation or can, can suffering or can persecution? Or No, he said, in all these things, we're more than conquerors. And then fourth, suffering is for a few. It's for those special saints. Well, no, what Jesus says this morning is a part of the normal Christian experience. This is something that is true of every follower of Christ. These things can be expected of anyone who follows Christ. So 
Let's then ask the question, what is the reason for this persecution? What is the reason for the persecution? Before we look at that, I want to just say a word about this word persecution because we see it in verse 10, we see it in verse 11, and we see it in verse 12. So in three verses, three times, Jesus talks about this. This word persecution or persecute here literally could be understood to pursue somebody, to chase after them. And, and obviously in the context and the way this word is used, it's to pursue them and to chase after them with the idea of doing them harm. So that's kind of the visual picture of the word that Jesus uses here, to harass, to cause someone suffering is the word that he has chosen. It is in what is called the perfect passive, and the reason that's important is simply this. The perfect speaks of something that's happened in the past with continuing results. The passive speaks of something that's happening to you. So we could literally read this verse this way. Blessed are those who have been willing and continue to be willing to be persecuted. So blessed are those who have been willing and who continue to be willing to be persecuted. This is what Jesus says to us. So the question before us is then, why is it that we are experiencing this adversity? And Jesus tells us, I want to start off again by saying what it's not, okay? I want to start off by saying these are not the reasons why we should be persecuted. And the first one would be it's not for being offensive, it's not for being obnoxious, it's not for being rude as a Christ follower, all right? Those should not be the reasons why we are persecuted. It shouldn't be because we're a poor worker at work. And, with, and, and because we're a poor worker, we don't get a promotion or we don't get a raise or we get demoted. And because we're such a poor worker, those things happen to us and yet we play the persecution card and, and make it seem as if, well, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. Some Christians, frankly, are just obnoxious, aren't they? And, and when they're obnoxious and they experience bad things, they shouldn't say, well, I know why this is happening to me, because I'm a Christian. It may not have anything to do with you being a Christian. It might have to do with you just being obnoxious and, and offensive and rude, right? Any of those things could happen. So what Jesus says, I think, in effect to us is the message of the cross and the message of Christianity, yes, that's offensive. People don't like to be told that they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They don't like to be told that there isn't anything that they can do to earn salvation. The cross is offensive, but the message, while it is offensive, the messenger should not be offensive. We don't need to be offensive as we bring that message. In fact, we should be anything but that, right? So Jesus isn't saying, blessed are you when you're persecuted for being obnoxious, offensive, and rude. Okay, so let's put that one aside. He secondly isn't saying, blessed are those who are persecuted for doing wrong, for doing wrong. I, there must be something that we need to take note of here because Peter mentions this on a couple of occasions. This idea that persecution coming into our life should never come our way because we're in fact doing things that are wrong. Suffering for doing wrong. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the, on the day of visitation. Now that sounds a lot like the passage that we're going to look at, Lord willing, next Sunday. And we're, we're not surprised by that, are we? Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that they don't see these things in your life that should cause difficulty for you. In, in that same chapter, in verse 20, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, you know? So you do something wrong, you sin, and you get in trouble for it. There's no credit in that. There's no value in that. You can't say I'm being persecuted when in fact you've done something specifically to bring that upon yourself or even over in chapter 3 and verse 16 having a good conscience so that when you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame for it is better to suffer for doing good 
if that should be God's will, then for doing evil. So that one seems pretty clear, doesn't it? We don't suffer for being obnoxious and offensive and rude. We don't suffer because we've done something wrong. Thirdly, we don't suffer persecution for following some religious political cause. Now, this one's a little bit maybe more difficult at times to discern. There's a kind of a fine line there sometimes, isn't there, between jumping into the political religious fray, if you will, and, and realizing that, that those are biblically grounded convictions and beliefs, and so that certainly is appropriate. But we don't claim persecution because we stake out some political position that's not grounded necessarily in Scripture, because we have a view of the world and, and of, our, of our circumstances that takes us into some setting that, that is a popular cause or maybe a, not a popular one. Jesus isn't talking about those things. I think there's a reason this, this beatitude is last. And I think that reason is Jesus wants you to know that there are times when wrong treatment comes your way even when you're doing the right thing. And so I think, secondly, persecution comes, Jesus says, because of righteousness. We are persecuted, Jesus says, for righteousness' sake, for being, in fact, like the Lord Jesus Christ. Just step back into our study of last week. You determined that you want to be a peacemaker. Interesting, isn't it? The next beatitude says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Your peacemaking efforts may not be appreciated by some people. They may want to go to war with you. They may want to, they, they may want to be in a, a, a fight with you, and they may not appreciate at all the fact that you have taken the stance of being a peacemaker. Merciful, meekness, mourning over sin, all of those things bring persecution into our life in some circumstances, Jesus said. Do you notice in verse 11 what he says? Blessed are you when others revile you, when they persecute you, when they utter all kinds of false things against you. He doesn't say if these things happen, does he? He says they're going to happen. When these things happen, you determine by God's grace to live your life as Jesus lived his life. You determined by God's grace and by the, the enabling work of the Holy Spirit in your life to live out these beatitudes. And Jesus' promise to you is, in doing that, you should be prepared to be hated. You should be prepared to be despised. You should be prepared to be rejected for living the Christ life, for following after Christ in the way that you do. Listen to what the rest of Scripture says about this very thing. Paul speaks to this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. He says this, Indeed, all who des desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <laughs> That's pretty plain, isn't it? You desire to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be opposition to that life that you're choosing to live. Or how about if you go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3 that no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. Wow. We're destined for this, to face persecution, opposition, hostility, rejection in this life because you're living out the life of Christ. That's our destiny. It's to be expected, in other words, right? Go uh, another few pages back to Philippians chapter 129. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Same thing. So you think of the life of our Lord, right? Here's this picture, this portrait of Jesus. This is how he lived his life. He was totally dependent on the Father every moment of every day. He was absolutely filled with a spirit of meekness, strength under control. He was a man who saw sin and mourned over it in his spirit. He pursued after righteousness like no one ever did. He was a man who was compassionate and merciful and kind. And look at the world's response to him. 
Jesus tells us why that is so. In John chapter 15, listen to what it says in verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Do you realize that there's no reason in the world for any Christ follower who's at all familiar with the Bible to realize that God has called us by his son Jesus into a life in which the world is going to stand in opposition to us at every turn. In which the world is going to see what we are attempting to do by way of living out a life of righteousness and not hate us for that, not revile us for that, not persecute us for that, not turn against us for that. He's told us as much, hasn't he? He's also told us, in effect, in John 15, if you don't want any of that to happen to you, it's real simple. You just live like the world, right? You just talk like the world. You just act like the world. You laugh at the things that the world laughs at. You enjoy the entertainment that the, that the world enjoys. You fit into what would normally, for a Christian, be an uncomfortable circumstance, and you just remain quiet. Something un toward is going on, you say nothing. Something unethical is happening, you just keep your mouth shut. That's exactly what Jesus says in John 15. If you don't want to experience this, then it's really simple. As a follower of Christ, you just remain oblivious to the differences that should exist between you and the world. And you live as much like the world as you possibly can. And if you do that, if you don't stand for righteousness, You'll never have to worry about persecution. You remember back in March when Vice President Pence, in the course of just a simple interview, made some comment about having a personal conviction in which he did not eat or go out to dinner or lunch or whatever with a woman other than his wife alone. And do you remember the response of the world? And I'll just use that in a broad category. It was predictable, and it was vicious, and it was amazing how the world reacted to a man who said, I have a basic conviction that I don't want to put myself in a place where I could be compromised for any reason. And I just went back and Googled some of the stories that were written. One person said, this is hurtful for the vice president to have this position. This hurts women. This is an insult to men and to women. And, and the, the, the tone and tenor of these responses of the vitriol and the name-calling and the mockery that he underwent was just crazy in response to that. And then what? And then along comes Harvey Weinstein. And along comes the blowing off of the lid in this country of all kinds of behavior that has been going on unnoticed, if you will, and unchecked in the general populace. And I ask you a simple question. Who do you want your wife, your sister, your daughter hanging out with? A man who says, I can promise you this, I'll never be alone with her in a compromising place. There'll be somebody with us. Or do you want her subjected to the behavior of a man like Harvey Weinstein, and unfortunately we're learning a host of all other kinds of men. And you know, it grieves my heart this morning to realize that there are probably in the lives of many of you ladies things that may not have risen to the level of what we're hearing, but things that kind of fall into that general category. And here is Jesus, and he's saying to us, as a follower of Christ, it's not a matter of if this is ever going to happen to you. You should be equipping yourself in such a way 
that when this, in fact, happens, you have already decided ahead of time what you're going to do. And you're going to trade Christ for comfort. And you're going to trade Christ for security. And you're going to trade Christ for success. And you're going to trade Christ for popularity. You're going to just take Christ for whatever the other choice is out there. Because that's exactly what Jesus has called us to. He's called us to live a life of righteousness. And that life, he says, is going to invite into your life the disrespect and the mockery of the world because they can't figure you out. They don't know what makes you tick. They don't understand why you value things that you can't even see. You talk about a God that they, that, that they can't comprehend, a work on a cross 2,000 years ago that changed your life forever. Praying and believing that it works. So Jesus says, you will be persecuted. And he tells us what that's going to look like. What's the nature of this persecution? He, he uses three words to tell us what it is that we can expect. He says, first of all, you will be reviled. And that speaks of verbal abuse primarily. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a verbal assault, disgrace, blaming, mocking, insulting, you know, we have that, that, that statement that's totally false that says sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And it's true that sticks and stones can break bones, but it is not true that words don't hurt because words have a way, don't they, of cutting us right to the quick of, of our heart and soul. So Jesus says that's one of the things that you can expect. You can expect people are going to revile you. They're going to be verbally abusive to you because you're a Christ follower. He says they're going to persecute you. It's the word that we already have mentioned, this idea of people running after you, of people pursuing you with the intent to harm you. And clearly, this includes, it's not limited to, but it includes all the way to persecution by death. So it's this physical continuum of everything from imprisonment and, and beatings and, and, and deprivation physically all the way to martyrdom. And you know that this generation, this century that we find ourselves living in, in the, 20, the 20th and the 21st century, there have been more Christians martyred for their faith than all of the others combined. So this is a reality that many people are facing, isn't it? And then he says, thirdly, they will slander you. They will slander you. It's, it's one thing for someone to say something mean and hurtful about you, but yet it's true. <laughs> I'm not sure what that might look like, but, you know, they, they say something that's not very nice, but at least there's some truth to it, right? To me, it's an altogether different thing. When somebody just flat out makes up something that is without any basis, in fact, and they attribute that to you or they say that about you, and that's what Jesus is saying here. That's what it means to slander. Say something that is false, to accuse somebody of something that they never did, that they never said. Now, let me just make... Two quick observations before we go on. As you think about what Jesus has said, first observation is this. These verses are not saying that you're going to be persecuted every day and for everything, all right? That's not what Jesus is saying. That wasn't true in Jesus' life. That wasn't true in the life of the disciples and those who have followed after him. So it's not that this is necessarily 24-7, now, obviously, we can go through some really difficult times and hard circumstances, but he is saying here that if you live a godly life, you live a life that's characterized by righteousness, these things are going to happen to you. They will provoke a response from the world that involves conflict and pushback and resentment and reviling and persecution and slander. And then second observation, some level of persecution may even come from religious people. Jesus experienced that, didn't he? It was certainly true in his experience. His followers did as well. You read the book of Acts, much of the opposition came from supposedly religious people. Even today, you can gather a large group of people who will gladly rally around broad, general religious themes, right? 
We have a great ecumenical sense about us where we should all be coming together and singing kumbaya about just religious ideas and spiritual ideas and, and, and things that are, are, are accepted by everybody. But of course, when you start talking specifics about what the Bible teaches, what the Bible says about Jesus as the Son of God, the only way to the Father, the idea that he actually died on a cross in substitution and payment for sin. You know, and you get into the, the, to the, the meat of the truth of the gospel. Well, then, of course, that unity dissipates in a hurry. And people will have all kinds of opinions about you and your beliefs and your convictions. And so this isn't exclusive in that sense to just the world it is also true sometimes even of those within the religious circles as well. So what do we do with this? Notice fourthly, point D, what's the proper response to persecution? I'm confident that if you're a Christ follower for very long, you have experienced something in your life that fits on this continuum of being reviled, persecuted, or slandered. It may not rise to the level of what many have experienced down through church history, but all of us know what it is to be laughed at, to be mocked, to have people say things about us because of the fact that we're following Christ. So then Jesus addresses what we're to do in response to this, and this is where it gets really hard, okay? We thought that first part was hard. Look, look what he says here. How do we respond to this? Verse 12, he says, you are to rejoice and be glad. So when these things happen to you, you are to rejoice and be glad. So he starts off and says, we're commanded to rejoice. This is a command. This is a present imperative. This means that we are to continuously be glad and rejoice. It's a command and it's present tense. In fact, we are to be, he says, exceedingly glad. Now, if this all sounds difficult, listen to what he says in the companion passage in Luke chapter 6 and verse 23. Rejoice in that day, all right? In, in that day when, when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they spurn your name as evil on the count of the Son of Man, Jesus says, verse 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so they did to your fathers. Is, it, is that amazing or what? Not just be glad, not just be exceedingly glad, but Jesus actually says, leap for joy when you face that kind of circumstance. Now, that is not exactly what I thought would be a good response in the face of persecution. I mean, most naturally, we would want to retaliate, wouldn't we? Somebody says something about us that's not true, that's unkind, doesn't mean you can't bring evidence against that. But, but most of the time, our flesh wells up and we want to counterpunch, don't we? We want to come back at them with something. We want to strike back. We may fall into a time of self-pity. Look how, look how bad things are for me. Look what's happening to me because I'm following Jesus. And we could easily fall into a pit of self-pity and, and want to pull other people in there with us, Right? Tell as many people as we can about how terrible this is and all that's happening to us. Not exactly what Jesus says. So my question is, how in the world can you do this? How can you respond this way? He has commanded us to rejoice and be glad, be exceedingly glad, leap for joy with gladness. Well, we know you have to be experiencing the power and the working of God's Spirit, right? I mean, that is a given. You can't do this. You can't obey this passage apart from the Holy Spirit's work in your life. But Jesus gives us two things to help us understand how this is possible. And notice in verse 12 when he says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we have two reasons that Jesus gives us here by way of encouragement for how this can happen. I want to start with the last one first. The last one he says is, you're in good company. 
when, when you realize that you are being singled out as a follower of Christ and living in righteousness and the world pushes against you and mocks you and, 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 and slanders you and persecutes you, Jesus says, well, first thing you can do is you can understand, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're not in this alone. This isn't the first time this has happened to somebody. And I think you could go so far as to say you're not just in good company. You're what? You're in exceptional company. You're in amazing company. I mean, think of the prophets and the apostles and the great men and women of faith who have gone before us and who have experienced the very things that Jesus is talking about here. So it's not as if we're in this alone. I I suppose a good exercise would be to go to Hebrews 11, right? In verse 36, others suffered mocking and flogging, even in chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. That's the picture of the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews 11, a snapshot of what God's people have endured. So one of the things that we can do to receive encouragement as we go through that experience is to realize this has been part and parcel of God's people and what they've experienced from the beginning. Second thing that we can do is we can be reminded that Jesus said, when you go through this and when you respond as you should, great, he says, is your reward in heaven. We're promised a reward. Now, nobody understood that better than the Apostle Paul. Paul understood when he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, so we do not lose heart. And you know, Paul experienced everything imaginable in his spiritual life. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Jesus says to us, when the world treats you in the way they treated me, I want you to remember that if you respond as I have commanded you to, and you rejoice even in the midst of this mistreatment, you're going to be rewarded for it. You're going to be compensated by God for what you endure and for what you suffer. And I think this, I think the suffering is commensurate with the reward, or the reward is commensurate with the suffering. The greater degree to which you suffer, the greater degree to which you will be rewarded if you respond as you should, if you walk in faithfulness with God through this experience. It can't be that every child of God who goes through suffering is going to receive the exact same reward at the end of the day. That's not what the Bible teaches about the doctrine of rewards, by the way. Some people just pull back from the idea that they're going to be rewarded by God for doing the things that he's told them to do. We shouldn't pull back from that. That's part of the motivation that God has given us, that Jesus has taught us. And I believe, if I'm reading this right, to the degree that you're faithful, to the degree that you're obedient, to that degree you will be rewarded. And as you go through that experience, and as you suffer through that experience, and as you endure, and as you give glory to God and lean upon him, great, Jesus says, will be your reward in heaven. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, of course, had his life taken in Germany by Hitler, said, with him, they lost everything. Talking about those men and women around him who suffered greatly. With him, they lost everything, and with him, they found everything. Reminds me of Jim Elliott's statement, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, right? You give up what you can't keep anyway, you gain 
but you can't lose. When the world encounters the Christian, when you and I live our life in righteousness before the world, not obnoxious, not offensive, not rudeness, Christ-likeness, when we do that, we're going to have conflict. There's going to be a, a sense of guilt that is stirred up. There is going to be resentment. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be persecution. Jesus promised us that would be the case. But he said, great would be your reward in heaven. So what do we take away? If you want an easy life, right? Choosing to follow Christ is not the way. <laughs> If you want a life that is free from persecution, free, free from being reviled, free from slander, then don't, then don't choose to be a follower of Christ and don't choose to walk in righteousness because to follow Christ means you have to count the cost. Jesus did that for us, didn't he? He counted the cost for us when he went to, went to the cross and it cost him his life as he died in payment for our sin, allowing us the wonderful opportunity of putting our faith and trust in him alone and receiving the gift that's eternal life. That's what God has done for us in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for the words of Christ that prepare us and equip us, Father, to live in the midst of a fallen world. And Jesus spoke with great realism. He spoke with, with great honesty to us. He, he spoke words of, of preparing us, Father, for the days that are upon us and the days that are coming. And I pray for the, for the believers of Covenant Community Church, and I pray for believers in Christ all around this world, Father, who, who will take a stand for you, who will take a stand for the gospel, who will stand for the truth of your word, and who will face great and growing hostility in the midst of this world but we pray that your spirit will equip us and strengthen us father give us the grace to believe you that as we respond and do so with joy and rejoicing that you will meet us right where we are and carry us through for we pray this in jesus name amen